Hello, and welcome to Law Talk. My name is John Celebrezzi, and I'm the co-founder of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project, as we call it, CZ CLEP for short. Our organization provides continuing education about the judiciary and legislature to attorneys, judges, government officials, and the general public. As a career ed educator, I recognize early on how important legal matters are and, and how they impact our lives. I am the nephew of the late Anthony J. Celebrezzi, who was the popular five-term mayor of Cleveland and a member of President Kennedy's cabinets. As a tribute to his lifetime commitment to the legal process, we dedicate this show. John's special guest today is Justice McGee Brown of the Ohio Supreme Court. A series of firsts defines the judicial career of Justice Brown. She was the first Afro-American woman elected to the Franklin County Common Pleas Court. She became the first Afro-American woman to serve as a justice on the Supreme Court of Ohio. A common theme in Justice McGee Brown's professional and community work is her advocacy for children and families. Let's join them now. Justice Brown, welcome to Law Talk. Thank you. You are hold the distinction of being our first Ohio Supreme Court Justice to be on our show. Wow, thank you. And just very, very excited to have you. Uh, no doubt our viewers have a lot of questions and of what you do in your job as, mm -hmm. as uh, Justice on the Ohio Supreme Court, mm -hmm. one of seven, right? Right. Who uh, make decisions that have a big impact on all of us. So, That's correct. Uh, you know, we're honored to have you here today. Justice, what inspired you to become a judge? Well, you know, it's interesting. I uh, became, first became a judge at the age of 32. I had started my career in the Attorney General's office. Then I was the Chief Legal Counsel for the Ohio Department of Corrections and the Ohio Department of Youth Services, which is the Juvenile Corrections arm. And you know, it was one thing seeing adults locked in prison. Seeing kids, it just didn't feel good seeing kids locked up. Yeah. And I kept thinking, maybe if they had a different circumstance or were given different options, they wouldn't be here, because to see 15, 16, 17-year-old kids who should be at proms or football sure. games and in shackles wasn't prison, easy. Yeah. yeah. Right. So at the age of 32, I decided to run for judge in Franklin County. Um, back then, it, it was a very Republican county, and nobody thought I could win. But I just thought I had a message that I wanted to tell people about mm -hmm. why I believed I could make a difference on juvenile court. And I became the first African-American woman elected to the Franklin County Common Pleas Court 20 years ago in 1992. Wow. Um, and I used that job, really, to, to Further, my uh, quest to work on behalf of vulnerable children, children who were abused and neglected, and I think part of that stems from my background. I grew up in the inner city. My mother was a teenage mom. I never knew my father. I have two younger brothers. We all have different fathers, and so my mother had to work two jobs just to take care of us. And I looked at a lot of people in my community who just didn't get the opportunities I did. They did not get to go to college. They didn't get to go to law school, and so. I've just been trying to pay forward. I see. Well, that's quite a story. Yeah. And, uh, and congratulations. Uh, wow. Here you are today. Um, I've been very blessed. Well, very blessed. The, um, the person that uh, our organization, CZ, Celebrezzi Zangi, uh, honors with this entire nonprofit is my uncle, Anthony J. Celebrezzi. Mm -hmm. He had a saying, which I think uh, he was a son of an Italian immigrant mm -hmm. that went all the way to the, the president's cabinet. And I think it would, you would apply to this, Justice, is only in America. Only in, in America, America, that's and right. So people need to remember, you could do whatever you want in this, right. in this country if you work hard at it. Well, okay, let's get down to brass tacks. Uh, the Supreme Court, I've, in, in that chair, we've had municipal court judges, juvenile court judges, domestic relations judges couple of appellant judges, but you're our first Supreme. So uh, a state Supreme Court justice, and you, you've had other judge positions, mm -hmm. how's it different, differ justice than, let's say, an appellant judge? 
Well, as the Supreme Court, we, we're different from the appellate court because we're not an error correction court. So by that I mean for 96% of people in this state, the appeals court is as far as they go. We are a constitutional court, so we make decisions about constitutional issues and about issues that have broad general impact to the entire state. I see. So most people will stop at that appellate court level. Um, we only accept about 5% of the cases that come in. I see. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So a very, very small percentage, mm -hmm. uh, not error correction, but bigger issues, constitutional that's issues. That's right. Uh, is it good law or is it bad law? Right. That sort of thing. Does it comply with the Constitution? Yes. Okay. Interesting. And of a great impact on our profession. Qualifications, Justice, to, to hold a position as you're holding today, mm -hmm. anything different than maybe when you ran for? Same qualifications. If you can run for judge, you can run for the Supreme Court. You have to have practiced a minimum of six years six in years. Ohio. Um, and you have to get elected statewide. It's a big state, oh, yeah. you know, 11 and a half million people. Um, you just have to be willing to work hard. And it's a lot of work. We go through about 150 cases every two weeks. We work on a two week cycle. So we hear 10 to 12 merit cases every two weeks. Then we go through about another 100 to 125 memorandums uh, for jurisdiction. Those are people asking to come to the Supreme Court. I see. We have to rule on those. We get certified questions from the federal court, uh, cases from the Public Utilities Commission, workers' comp, uh, discipline cases. We do about 10 to 12 discipline cases every two weeks. And then, of course, we get requests to be admitted without examination. Those range anywhere from about five to 10 requests every two weeks. So well, it's busy. We're right. always reading. Busy places, right. Whenever I'm traveling, I'm reading. You'll see me. I've got a file because it's the only way to keep up on the work. Sure, sure. Just answer this question and we can go from there. Why must all, all Ohio attorneys register with the state Supreme Court? Well, one, because once you're licensed, we want to know where you are. So we have that, that biannual okay. registration. Two, attorney registration fees help support the discipline system of our state. They help support the administration of lawyer services. You know, we have um, a judicial college. We have our judicial e-academy. And so that registration fee helps make sure that we're meeting the needs of lawyers in the state and it funds the state's lawyer discipline system. I see. So I, I think our viewers would be very interested in knowing this, Justice, that all of us in the, the local bar, we're, we're, we can't practice law unless we're registered with the Supreme Court. That's right. It was actually, uh, next month there'll be a bar exam mm -hmm. given to all prospective attorneys. Always a mm -hmm. fun experience to go right. through. Right, we've all done it. Yeah, and prob <laughs> probably. Three days of torture. <laughs> <laughs> for, yeah, I, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, it, it was, uh, when I, when I took the bar exam, mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was very um, heartwarming, actually, to see our former Chief Justice, mm -hmm. Moyer Kem, and uh, addressed us as we were in the midst of doing this mm -hmm. and giving us a little bit of a boost here. Okay, yeah. you're almost there, you know, and yeah. uh, of course, so once you take that exam, you have to wait a while to see if you actually pass. Right. But, uh, but at any rate, it's the Supreme Court that creates and administers the bar exam. That's right. Okay, so... Uh, and it's the Supreme Court as you and your your uh, your colleagues mm -hmm. will actually swear in these new lawyers. Yes. Uh, which is a very happy day if you're mm -hmm. fortunate enough to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, so we uh, we're, we are all basically connected right to where you work oh as yeah. whatever. Okay. Now it's not a, a pleasant topic, but there are some things in law that aren't pleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, lawyers are just like anybody else. Every now and then they screw up. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned attorney discipline. Yes. Uh, I, maybe some of our viewers don't know that that we are really actually controlled uh, significantly by the, the, by the rules Court. of the Supreme well, you Court. You know what? To me, and I've, I've felt this way ever since the day I took the oath. I've been a lawyer 27 years. And on the day you raise your hand to take that uh, oath to uphold the United States and Ohio Constitution, there can be no prouder feeling. And so there is an ethical and a moral obligation. Actually, lawyers are held to a higher standard. When you're representing clients, you have to represent them ethically and zealously. You can't steal from them. You can't 
can't just put their case aside. And so the lawyer discipline that we all most often deal with, lawyers who have their own substance abuse or mental health issues, yeah. neglect of a client matter, stealing money from a client, or taking on a matter that you're not competent to perform. And so our interest is not in being harsh with lawyers. Our goal with attorney discipline is to protect the public. We take certain things, though, very seriously. If you steal from a client, that calls for a suspension. Sure. I mean, that, that violation of client trust, the Supreme Court will start from that. Now, sometimes we'll walk back from a suspension and give you a stayed suspension, given if there's some serious mitigating circumstances. Mm, but we see our role to make sure that that small percentage, and it's a very small percentage, we've got almost 30,000 lawyers in this state, and it's a very small percentage that violate their license. Sure. For our viewers to know that contrary to some of the bad lawyer jokes and whatnot that are mentioned about us, and I can sort of say this firsthand because in mm -hmm. my other life I was a teacher and a school administrator, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lawyers are regulated oh, and yes. disciplined, I think more so than people would think. Oh, yes. And uh, it is the Supreme Court that does that mm -hmm. to keep us all on the straight and narrow. And uh, so many lawyers do such good work that never gets recognized. The number of lawyers in the state that do pro bono work, which means provides legal services sure. for free to people who can't afford it and would not otherwise have access to the court system. We have lawyers who volunteer, who raise money, who do free legal service, and those people don't get the acknowledgement that they deserve because, of course, everybody focuses on the salacious sure, uh, sure. story. But it always yeah. seems to happen that way. Yeah. They say safe landings of airplanes don't sell newspapers. Right. But uh, but I think it's a it's a good point, and I to have you here to you know point that out that. Uh, uh, you give the exam, your Supreme Court, mm -hmm. we have to pass the exam. Uh, we, we had to pass it too. That's <laughs> right. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's, that's, right. A, that's right. That's You're right. absolutely <laughs> right. You know, uh, but uh, once once you pass it and once you are admitted, mm -hmm. and as you say, you great pride when you raise that that's hand. That's right. But you know that there are rules and uh, you don't ever forget that. Uh, I think lawyers in general, mm -hmm. uh, I made my own editorial comment, I and mean, when I first started to work as a paralegal, uh, I, I picked up on that right away as to uh, how serious we do take this professional right. code of conduct, as we should. As we should. One of the uh, topics, Justice, that I, I, again, it's not a very pleasant one, but it's, it's, it's greatly, it's certainly important, is the death penalty cases. Uh, the Supreme Court certainly plays a role in 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 deciding mm -hmm. not necessarily the evidence at the local level but they find their way to mm -hmm. you folks before something happens mm -hmm. uh, pretty drastic is what i'm talking mm -hmm. about here uh, you want to talk about that a little bit or i mean it's you know ohio has a death penalty and our job is to administer the law so um does it, the common pleas judge, a position you once held, mm -hmm. uh, a person is convicted by a, jur a jury of his peers, mm -hmm. normally when that happens, it goes to the District Court of Appeals, or in the ninth right. year right now. In fact, we've had mm -hmm. uh, Judge Dickinson on and uh, Judge mm -hmm. Belfence. But in a case of a death penalty, does it go it goes straight to the right Supreme to you, Court. Right there was a constitutional amendment passed, I don't know, eight or ten years ago that eliminated the appellate court review. So it goes right from the trial court and the jury's finding straight to the uh, Supreme Court. Now one of the things that's interesting is that when Ohio enacted life without parole, because forever Ohio had the death penalty, uh, life uh, to 15 to life or 20 to life or 30 to life. We never had life without parole. I see. Once the legislature passed life without parole, you see fewer and fewer death penalty cases actually being handed out and prosecutors are seeking the death penalty less often because there seems to be that jurors are tending to favor life without parole. But those cases have started to decrease because of that new option. I see. I see. But the actual death penalty Actually, it's an automatic, isn't it? I mean, it, it's an automatic appeal to our court. It's coming yes. to you. Mm -hmm. So, or every death penalty case mm -hmm. that 
albeit I'm glad to hear we don't have as many, but mm -hmm. we'll... We review. You and your colleagues will review. Yes. Uh, certainly a very sobering part and tough part mm -hmm. of your job. Mm -hmm. um, you sit as a group of seven. Mm -hmm. Um, I find that kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I really do. Uh, uh, I, I've, I've worked in the appellant courts mm -hmm. where, um, you know, you've got to convince two of three of a panel. Mm -hmm. But there you are as seven. Yes. And um, I know enough about you just by reading the papers and having mm -hmm. followed the court for a number of years. You're a pretty diverse group of people. We are. That's probably the understatement of the year right yes. there. Okay. But... With seven sitting on the court, mm -hmm. here's your question: Are 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 the are there cases where a majority of four are required? In other words, I guess what I'm trying to ask you: Is it always four that will decide it? It's always four. So that's big. It is because <laughs> on a four-three vote, yeah, that swing person. Mm -hmm. has but you know we're not like the US Supreme Court so there's no Kennedy on our court you know we had Anthony Kennedy on the US Supreme Court yeah. they, they talk a lot about him being the swing vote between you know the four they have nine so there's four on one right. side four on the other I can honestly say we don't have that person there's no one vote that's always the swing vote when you look at our decisions many of our decisions are seven zero or they're five two we try to avoid four, three decisions when we can. I see. Those are the ones, you know, when cases get to us, they aren't black and white, you know, so we really work hard to get as big a majority as we can. But when there is a four, three decision, if you look at it, it's never the same four, three. That majority changes depending on what the issue is and how people are looking at the case. Um, you mentioned Chief Justice Tom Moyer when he was alive. One of the last interviews he gave is he talked about the importance of having diversity on the Supreme Court. You have seven members, he said, because people believe you get seven different philosophies, gender, race, geography. That's what you want on a Supreme Court or seven people who are different, and we all are. Yeah. But I can say this to you, there is a collegial spirit on our court so that even when we have disagreements about the law, it's never disagreements that are personal. We don't disagree and say, oh, you're a bad person because you think this way. We debate the law, we make a decision, and when we walk out of the room, we'll go have dinner together. Yeah, sure. So it's a great environment to work in, but there is a lot of push and pull as we strive to get the best decision to lawyers that we can. Well, I must say, as a practicing attorney, I mean, one of my fantasies would be able to be a, a fly on the <laughs> wall to, to hear the <laughs> 70 of you uh, talking, <laughs> <laughs> discussing. Uh, wow, I could just only imagine, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but. God bless you. You 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 do it, and uh, uh, we have some you, interesting you, conversations. Well, you're, yeah. you're making a decision that's uh, decisions that affect a lot of people's lives. You but know? you know what's interesting, and and your viewers should know this. It's not like we're making those decisions though on a blank sheet of paper. You know, the, in in a Supreme Court, you are beholden to stare decisis, and so which means precedent. Sure. So we are a court that pays a lot of attention to what's been decided before, before us. us. We are a court that does not make huge sea changes in the law. If there has to be a change, it would be an incremental change. But we are a court that believes very much in precedent. So when we're starting to evaluate a case, we don't start from nothing. We're looking at, has the court ruled in this area before? What have been our previous holdings in regard to this area of the law? And do those still stand um, now, sure. given the current facts and the current law that we're evaluating. I see. So good old starry decisive. That's uh, right. What was decided before? What about a mi minority decision, Justice? I mean, uh, you you might not be with that four if if right. it, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so you write a minority decision. Mm -hmm. You have still have the right to speak That's your right. piece. That's right. Why is that significant, though? I mean, it's it it doesn't prevail the. Well, it'll be a win or lose on the majority, but it doesn't prevail that day. 
but a well-written dissent can still move the law forward. Really? Uh, yes, I, I believe that. I think that, you know, the reason that we have people write dissents is because you want to give a different point of view, and the law's not static. So you may not prevail today, but there are times, even now, when we're looking at a case, and one of the justices will say, well, you know, I wrote a dissent about that five years yeah. ago. <laughs> and so then you go back and you look at that dissent, and you say, you know what? You may be right. Yeah, I had so, a point. Yeah. Right. That, that's probably is, I'll compliment you, as good of an answer to that question I've ever heard. Oh. I mean, it, 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 you're, I never really thought about it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we get into this win-lose mode of thinking, that's right. and that's not what the law is all about yeah. anyway. That's right. Uh, so minority decisions are as is important that's as right. the majority decision. Mm -hmm. is. You know, wow, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, I, 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 can't, I can't pass this opportunity up yet, it, not necessarily from your tenure on the, the Supreme Court, but you can go everywhere you want. But boy, you, you, you've been judging a lot of different courts, and you've, you've seen a lot, all of you, every judge I've ever had mm -hmm. is, has an interesting story. So if I were to ask you, can you tell us about your most mo mem memorable court case? <laughs> you got one? Oh, they're all memorable. <laughs> no. Well, yeah, yeah. I, but you know, um, I, I always hesitate to answer those cases because what's memorable is probably the thing I did most recently because, you know, at this yeah. age, it's hard to remember what I did, you know, 15 years ago. But you know what? I, I can tell you that every l job that I've had, I, I've enjoyed it, yeah. you know. And so there were juvenile cases that um, some tore my heart out. Um, where you really had to struggle, I had to really go home at night and think about them. There are cases like that here because, you know, by the time things get to us, there are no easy answers. Sure. But, you know, we do any number of cases. They all are interesting. What I love about it is I'm continuing to learn new things. I mean, there are areas of law, like when you're talking about electric utilities, you think, well, that can't be exciting. But there are parts yeah. of it that you think about how that impacts job creation sure, here. Sure. It impacts a business's ability to invest here based on what their utility yeah. bill is. We've now got fracking coming up. That's going to be oh, a new area, a mineral one. rights. You know, so there's all of these new areas of the law, new questions questions that come to us that I enjoy immensely. Okay. Well, you, it's certainly, uh, we're, we're all product of our, our previous experiences and you certainly have a, a wonderful harvest uh, mm -hmm. to pick from there from all the justices have. Well, okay, uh, let's talk about, you know, I don't want to, we don't have to pin it down real specifically, but the DeRolf decision is always something that any school administrator, person like me, will discuss. Mm -hmm. it has to do with taxing, taxation. Mm -hmm. It was decided. Uh, can you explain the current status of it? I mean, mm -hmm. where where we're at, the court, the court, very court that you sit on, but it's been uh, it's been 15 years ago now, mm -hmm. maybe 1996. We're getting pretty mm -hmm. close. Uh, decided that our our form of taxation for schools is is really unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. Where are we now? Well, right now there's no case pending before the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court doesn't have anything going on. The legislature has received our order. The public is aware of what the court ordered. And if there's to be any change, it would be through the legislature. I see. Well, separation of powers. That's uh, exactly uh, right. You, you ruled. Throw it back to them. And bless the herd, they're still working on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And when I hang around my school administrator buddies, they're you know now they're still working on it. Mm -hmm. But it, they, in all fairness, there there has been progress made mm -hmm. in the building aspect of schools and whatnot. There've been some beautiful new schools yeah. built. Yeah, and, and and I think that was, uh, there's no doubt about it, that was a result of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. decision. Uh, we haven't got to the perfect way of funding schools yet, but mm -hmm. we're working on it. Okay, next month, yeah, mm -hmm. June. As my memory serves, July, mm -hmm. uh, there'll be those about 1,400 mm -hmm. young men and, men and women who are law school graduates that That's will right. enjoy the uh, experience of taking the Ohio Bar mm -hmm. Exam. You have now, I know you're modest, but credit where credit's due, you've reached the top rung. You really have. Okay. I would like for you, if you would, to be so kind, what advice would you give justice to the the new class of bar examinees well I mean, you've, you've <laughs> pretty much done it all yeah. 
Uh, w well, first I'd say in preparation for the bar exam, you know, I treated it like a job. I was determined I was taking the exam one time. So I spent all of June and up to the exam in July, that was my job. I just studied. Okay. I studied, studied, studied. So I think you've got to make sure that you're well prepared, that you've gone through your materials, you've invested the time, and that you're prepared. And when that three-day exam comes, you got to just relax and just go trust that you've got it in your head and you're going to be able to, to get it out. Okay. The second thing I would say is this, enjoy your career. You know, I know the economy feels uncertain to people right now and not every person taking the exam is going to have a job, but always know this, even if you can't get the job of your dreams, start down the path. So that means if you can't find a legal job right now, maybe you volunteer to write some briefs for a, a person who's a sole practitioner and they need some appellate work done. Offer to be a runner, to go down to the court and file things so that you can observe what's going on. Do something to keep point. yourself active sure. until you can get that job. And you're meeting lawyers, but don't just sit on the sidelines and say, woe is me, I don't have a job. You've got to be the captain of your fate. And so there's a lot of things you can do. It may not pay a lot. You may have to work at night doing something sure. different, but do that. And always, and this is the advice I give to graduates, I gave two law school commencements this season. And I say to law school graduates, never accept a job based on money. Do what makes your heart sing. Do what makes you jump out of bed, ready to go to work the next day, because if you do that, you're going to have a really satisfying legal career. You've got to do something that you have passion about, not just something that gives you a paycheck. Okay. Very well done. On the subject of uh, law school commencements and whatnot, I, 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 I think I'm correct. You recently gave the commencement address at Ohio Northern, I correct? I did, Which yes. Is where Anthony J. Celebrezzi, my uncle, graduated from 1938. Yes. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, next our next show, we believe, will be the winner of the Anthony J. Celebrezzi Moot Court Competition oh. from Ohio Northern. Very so in good. that very, very seat, we're going to have a young lady who has exhibited great uh, ability mm -hmm. here who was going to be one of those people who was taking that exam that you just gave the <laughs> advice to. So yes. I, I think that's just the perfect way to end our show today. I can't thank you enough for being here. You've been it's a great, pleasure. great guest. I, I want you to know the invitation is open. You can come back anytime you thank want. You. Uh, I know you have lots of extracurriculars as <laughs> maybe would be one say, uh, other than being a Supreme Justice, you're very, very involved in the community, particularly with young people, yes. kids, or your favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, if you ever run into a program that you would like our viewers to know anything about, mm -hmm. feel free to come back and tell Absolutely. us all about it. Okay. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for being our guest on Law Talk today. Thank you. Comments made by John's guest on Law Talk are solely those of his guest and do not necessarily reflect the views of Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project. To view this show and others, go to www.cdzclub.org. In the Wandsworth area, a complete listing of dates and times of this broadcast. Tune in to WCTV Channel 15 or log on to wandsworthcity.com and follow the links to WCTV. At CZ Club, we're devoted to the education of today's legal issues. Fueled by the public's keen interest in our legal system and current events, CZ Club is dedicated to the educational venues aimed at enhancing the understanding by all citizens, regardless of age, education, occupation, or wealth. A function of the Celebrezzi Zangi Community Legal Education Project. <laughs>